All right, good morning, everybody, and welcome to Christ Memorial Lutheran. Uh, thrilled that y'all are here to worship with us this morning. Um, would you go ahead and please stand, and we'll, we'll begin with some music. It is good having you here worshiping and praising God. Uh, also, those who are joining us online, thanks for being here with us today. I am Pastor Bauer. I've been here a couple of times. I'm a retired pastor, served at Pilgrim Lutheran, which is on Chimney Rock and Beech Nut for many years, retired about seven years ago, working part-time at Fishers of Men down in Sugarland right now, but glad to be here and share God's word with you this morning. Um, let's uh, begin. Uh, with a word of prayer, and then we'll have our opening song, All Creatures of Our God and King. Let us pray. Lord God, Heavenly Father, how great it is to come into your house and worship and praise you. And so we worship you this day as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Be with us, guide us, and protect us. In the most precious name of Jesus, all God's people said, Amen. Please join with me in all creatures of our God and King.
God's presence to praise and worship him, that we take a moment of confession. Let's take a moment of silent confession, and then we'll join together. Let us confess our sins to God, our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved you as our neighbors have. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us, forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. This is the good news of God. If we confess with our lips that Jesus is Lord, we are forgiven. And as his servant, and in the place of Jesus, I, as a called ordained servant, announce the forgiveness of all of your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen? Amen. 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 You can be seated. Body bound and drenched in. 
Good morning. Good morning. Our first reading is from Job chapter 38, verses 4 through 18, and can be found on page 443 of your Pew Bible. Oh, I forgot, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Tell me if you have the understanding. Who determined its measurements? Surely you know. Or who stretched the line upon it? On what were its bases sunk? Or who laid its cornerstone when the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy? Or who shut in the sea with doors when it burst out from the womb when I made clouds its garment and thick darkness its swaddling band and prescribed limits for it and set bars and doors and said, Thus far shall you come and no farther, and here shall your proud waves be stayed. Have you commanded the morning since your days began and caused the dawn to know its place, that it might take holds of the skirts of the earth and the wicked be shaken out of it? It is changed like clay under the seal, and its features stand out like a garment. From the wicked, their light is withheld, and their uplifted arm is broken. Have you entered into the springs of the sea, or walked in the recesses of the deep? Have the de gates of death been revealed to you, or have you seen the gates of deep darkness? Have you comprehended the expanse of the earth? Declare, if you know all this. The second reading is from Romans chapter 10, verses 5 through 17. For Moses writes about the righteousness that is based on the law, that the person who does the commandments shall live by them. But the righteousness based on faith says, do not say in your heart who will ascend to heaven, that is, to bring Christ down, or who will descend into the abyss, that is, to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? The word is near you, in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith that we proclaim. Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. For the scripture says, everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing his riches on all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then will they call on him whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. But they have not obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed what he has heard from us? So faith comes from hearing, and hearing through the word of Christ. Let us rise with the reading of the Holy Gospel. We rise, it's a tradition to say that we're willing to take this gospel message into the world. And this is the Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 14th chapter. Immediately, Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side while he dismissed the crowds. And after he had dismissed the crowds, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone. But the boat by this time was a long way from the land, beaten by the waves, for the wind was against them. In the fourth watch of the night, he came to them walking on the sea. But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified and said, It is a ghost. And they cried out in fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them, saying, Take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. And Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. He said, Come. So Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water and came to Jesus. 
But when he saw the wind, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Jesus immediately reached out his hand and took hold of him, saying to him, O oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased. And those in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly you are the Son of God. Here ends our gospel. Let us join together in confessing our faith in the ancient creed, the Apostles. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Will the congregation please be seated? And I'd like to ask the children to come up for a moment. And I'm going to have you stand right there. We're going to practice some social distancing here. Uh, back, well, I know your brother and sister, but we'll still do it. No, no, wait a minute. One, okay. All right. All right. Are you guys ready? Have you ever played Follow the Leader? No? Okay. Follow, follow the Leader is somebody's in charge. That's going to be me. Okay. And whatever I do, you do. So if I take a big step, you take a big step. If I take little steps, you take little steps. Okay? But you follow me right up in the line. Okay? Think we can do that? Let's try. Okay. So right behind me. Okay. Are you ready? Let's try that. Oh, they did pretty good, didn't they? Okay, I want to do it one more time, but this time I want you to close your eyes. Don't open them. Close your eyes. Keep them closed. Close your eyes. Hard. Now just do whatever I do. I think someone's peeking. I think you're peeking. I think you're peeking. <laughs> <laughs> you can't do it with your eyes closed, right? Yeah, because you got you got to look, you got to see the person. Today in the lesson that I just read, uh, the disciples and Peter are in this boat, and there's a big storm, and Jesus walks across the water, and then Peter gets out of the boat, and he's doing really good. He's following Jesus, but then he sees big waves. And he takes his eyes off of Jesus. I had you close your eyes so you couldn't see me. So it was like taking your eyes off of me. And then he started to sink. And Jesus is telling us in this lesson, that we always have to follow Jesus. We always have to look at him and follow him. And that's what I want you to remember. That's what I'm going to be talking about with you moms and dads, okay? Okay. Can you bow your heads for the blessing? May God Almighty bless and keep each and every one of you, his special little ones. Amen. Go back to your seats. They did good. Did real good. How many of you kept your eyes closed? None, probably. Yeah. <laughs> Keep your eyes fixed on Jesus.
grace to you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. There's a story told about three ministers who decided to go out fishing one day, an Episcopalian, a Methodist, and a Lutheran. And they're out fishing, and they realized that they had left their lunch cooler back at shore. So they decide to have a prayer, and they're praying. And the Lutheran pastor steps over the side of the boat and walks across the water and gets his lunch. Comes back, walking across the water, gets in the boat, and the Episcopalian priest says, where's mine? Lutheran pastor says, oh, I forgot it. So the Episcopalian priest steps out of the side of the boat, walks across the water, and gets his lunch. He comes back. The Methodist pastor says, where's mine? Episcopalian priest says, oh, I forgot yours. So the Methodist pastor prays and prays, steps over the side of the boat, and goes right down to the bottom. And the Episcopalian priest turns to the Lutheran minister and says, should we tell him where the stones are? And the Lutheran pastor says, what stones? <laughs> that wasn't meant to be denominational. <laughs> wasn't even true. You got that? <laughs> Today we, we hear this story about Peter walking on the water. In the gospel lesson that I read a moment ago, Jesus had just finished the feeding of the 5,000 the bread and the fish. And now he goes off to pray, and he sends the disciples on ahead, and it says to go to the other side. Now there in Capernaum, the other side is no longer Jewish territory. It's called the Decapolis. It's the 10 Greek cities. Actually, at this point, there are 12 cities. They still called it at that time the Decapolis. And he's going to go to the Gentiles to proclaim his message to them. And I want you to notice, every time in the New Testament, Jesus has something important to do. What does he do? He goes off and prays. And he's spending time in prayer, and he sees his disciples in distress. And he wants to go and help them. Now, these are fishermen. They're used to these strong, blustery waves. I, I'm told that it can get very severe on the Sea of Galilee. We think of a sea as kind of a lake, so it wouldn't be very much. But apparently, before the Sea of Galilee is the mountain rages. And when a, a storm comes down, it can really whip up the waves. And they're frightened out of their mind. But Peter, even though they think Jesus is a ghost, takes a risk. And he says, if it really is you, Jesus, tell me, and I'll get out of the boat. And he gets out of the boat, and he's doing fine. And then he sees the wind and the waves. He takes his eyes off of Jesus, and he starts to sink. But Peter took a risk. He was the only one of the disciples willing to get out of the boat. You know, most people don't like taking risks. We like what is comfortable. We like what is true and tested. I've heard, and I don't know if it's completed, I've heard that they're building a bridge in the Sea of Galilee near Capernaum where this happened. Did you hear what I said? Not a bridge over the water. They're building a bridge in the water. So people can walk on the water like Peter did. It's not the same. You're not taking a risk. What do you think it is that keeps people and keeps the church from being Peter risk takers? Getting out of that comfortable boat. What we're familiar with and doing something different. Well, uh, we don't like to get out of a routine. If this virus has shown us one thing, is we don't like 
not having a routine. It's easier just to do the same old thing. One time, my wife and I were visiting relatives in Baltimore, Maryland. And as we went home, we always took a, left hand, a right hand exit onto the main road. And we're driving down the beltway, and my wife says to me, points to a sign, and says, left lane. And I say, yeah, I know, and I'm driving in the right hand lane. And I keep driving. And the next sign comes, and she says, left lane. And I looked at her, I said, I know, and I'm in the right hand lane. And she finally said, left, left, left. And I had to pull across three lanes because I was used to going on the right hand lane. And she was telling me what was the correct lane. I wasn't listening because we like that routine. We're used to the routine. We fall into that. And we don't like it because we're afraid of what's going to happen if we're not in that routine. But notice what Jesus said. The first thing, it is I do not be afraid. In Luke 12, 13, he says, do not be afraid, little flock. Where is flock today? And he's saying, don't be afraid. Sometimes we need to take risks. As the world changes, and it is changing, we need to take risks to proclaim that gospel message. Sometimes we just need to get out of the boat. You know, the Lutheran church used to grow by birth rate. We had growth by children. Not anymore. I saw an interesting survey that was done in March of this year by a Christian organization where they contacted people who were not worshiping people. And they asked them if they would be open to hearing about God. 21.5% of the people said they were willing to hear more about God because they were afraid of what was happening in our world today. We have a great opportunity, but it might take some risks. Now, I'm not saying that we take a risk just for the sake of risk-taking. Some people like to take a risk because of the rush. I, I like to, to watch a show, America's Got Talent. There is some great talent, there's some lousy talent. But the one thing I really dislike about that show, and it seems like the judges always want to pick these uh, people who are daredevils. And I think that that's not entertainment. You don't risk your life for entertainment. And we're not talking about risking or getting out of the boat just to get that high. And I'm not saying do away with the old ways of doing things. The gospel message must remain. There are some churches today that kind of water down the, the Bible message just to be popular. That's not right. As Lutheran Christians, we need to hold on to that law and gospel, both very important. What I do mean to say is we have to look at what things we can do to make the church attractive to those who are not part of the fellowship, not for our sake. We're not doing this for our sake. And we're not doing it for the sake of the budget. I've heard some churches say, well, if only we had some more people in worship, then we could balance our budget. Very dangerous thing to say. Because then you're not doing it for the right motivation. The right motivation is that there are people in our world today who are dying without Christ. There are people living right now in misery because they don't know the love of God. This is a true story. That first one was all made up, but this is true. When I first got to Houston, Texas, I went to a pastor's meeting, and there was a Baptist minister there from one of the big Baptist churches here in Houston. And he told us a story. 
he said one Sunday morning he had a Sunday off. So he decided to go to another church. And he walked to the church, he walked in the church, and nobody said anything to him. He said, what do I do? And one of the ushers said, just sit down. So he sat down. He said, the pastor preached three good sermons that Sunday. Think about that for a minute. He said, nobody greeted us leaving. Nobody asked us for anything. He said, then my wife and I decided to go to a restaurant. Pulled up in front of the restaurant, and three guys ran out of the front of the restaurant and said, can we park the car for you? He said, how much? They said, oh, no, no cost. We just do this out of the gratitude for you coming. He said, we got out of the car. We walked in. There was a hostess. How can we help you today? We'd like to get you a nice seat. Sat down, had a great meal. They waited on us. When, when we left, they asked, is there anything else that we can do? Will you fill out a survey for us? And then he said this. If I was asked that Sunday morning to join that church or join that restaurant, I would have joined the restaurant. We have to look at our world today and be as wise as the world is wise. Jesus said it this way. He's sending out his disciples in Matthew 10. And he says, I want you to be wise as serpents. That doesn't sound like a Christian. But he goes on to say, wise as serpents and harmless as doves. So we look at the world. We take what is best. And we use that to proclaim God's word to the world in his love, in his care. I can remember when Chick-fil-A started this thing when you said, thank you, what did they say back? Oh, you all know it. I remember KSBJ, one of the Christian radio stations here in Houston, thought that was so unique they sent some of their reporters to go through the line and say thank you. And then on air, they held up so they could he hear, it's my pleasure. But have you noticed lately? Well, maybe you haven't been out at a restaurant. But before the pandemic, have you noticed how many restaurants and companies, when you say thank you, are now saying, it's my pleasure? Why? Because they realized that they had something, something good. And they used it. You and I need to be wise like that so that we can share the gospel message. Well, how do we know then if it's really of God? Not just something we want to do or something out of selfish desires. I'd like to share with you five things today. First of all, as individuals and as a congregation, we need to keep our eyes focused on Jesus. I quoted before Luke 12. Do not be afraid, little flock. Right before that, Jesus said, Seek first the kingdom of God and all other things will be added to you. Do not be afraid, little flock, for the Father has given you the kingdom. You and I have something very precious. We have forgiveness. We have life. Life eternal and a good life now as we rely on God. We want to get that out to the world. We want all people to know that. Secondly, we need to make a priority of study of God's Word. Before Peter got out of the boat, what did he do? Is it you, Lord? And then, yes, it is I. Do not be afraid. We need to always go back to the Scriptures and see what God wants for our lives, what God wants for our congregations. The gospel message can never be compromised. But how we proclaim it can be very different. The third thing we need to be about is prayer. In my ministry, I have seen sometimes prayer work miracles. 
there was one time while I was still serving at Pilgrim, we decided to have a building project. We needed a lot of things done. And I called together a committee of 12, and we sat down to discuss what we were going to do. And we had too many needs than we could ever accomplish. And I went around the room, and everybody had something different they wanted to do. And out of frustration, and I think this was a godly thing, I said, okay, we, we're so far apart. What are we going to do? I said, I'd like to challenge you. I want you to pray every morning at 7 a.m. and every evening at 7 p.m. and ask God what we need to do. And I kind of kept up with them, and we came back one week later, and everybody said, we prayed twice a day. And I went around the room, and we started to talk about it. And they said, well, you know, we don't need to do this. Maybe we can do that. Or maybe we could change that to this. And, then, and I was taking notes, and we got done. And I said, hey, do you know what just happened? We all agreed. This is the way we need to go. And everybody said, yes, best building project we ever did. Because it was grounded in prayer. And that's what we need to be about. We also need to stop and listen to God. Sometimes we just pray and tell God what we want instead of listening to Him and what He wants us to do. Uh, I have to admit, I'm, I'm sorry, I have to admit this, but uh, sometimes when my wife or children have a problem and they come to me with that problem, I'm not listening. I'm trying to figure out how to solve the problem. And I see a lot of wives kind of poking their husbands right now. <laughs> it happens, doesn't it? But we can't do that with God. We don't tell Him what we want. We ask Him and we listen. And finally, we got to try it. If you don't get out of the boat, nothing is going to work. So you got to try some different things. You know, sometimes I think Peter takes a bad rap in this story. He was the only one who got out of the boat. He tried it, and it worked. And when he took his eyes off of Jesus, what does it say? Jesus immediately, immediately reached out and helped him up and back into the boat. We have to be willing sometimes to fail. Because if we never fail, we've never tried anything. You know that statistic I told you about, 21.5%? I was thinking to myself, how could I reach out to that 21.5%. And then I thought, you know, there's a lot of people in our world today that are not members of a church. And I've met a lot of people who have said to me, I don't know if I could go to church. I, I don't know what's going to happen there. I, I'm afraid. But God has given us a great tool. He's kind of kicked us out of the boat with the coronavirus and have video. What a wonderful thing. You don't have to come to our church. Come and see Jesus on your TV on Sunday morning. See what we're all about. There's a lot of other things that we can do. I can't tell you what you need to do. I can't tell you as a church what you need to do. You need to decide that together. But these scriptures are challenging us today. Jesus is going over to the Gentiles. He's going to proclaim the message. And he's teaching a very important lesson. Get out of the boat and share that message because the world is dying without it. Amen? Amen. More important, I want to ask you, are you willing to do something about it this week? Amen? That was a little less amen.
Amen? Amen. 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 Okay. Let us rise as we join together in the prayer of the church. Oh, Lord, in our own ways we have no righteousness. We always shall fall short of your glory. But with you, clothed in baptism, we have the righteousness of Christ. Lord, we ask that you help us to be faithful in every circumstance and boldly confess Jesus and his saving name to our world. Guard all people who preach your word so that hearing people might believe and might have everlasting life. Lord, we pray and ask you to bless our nation and those who lead us. We have so many things going on right now. We ask that you guide all our elected and appointed civil servants that they might make proper and good judgments and bring peace on our land. Make us especially mindful of all those who need special protection, the aged and the oppressed. Lord, we remember before you today all who are sick, whether suffering body, soul, or mind. We remember those who are grieving, and especially those we name before you now in our hearts. Deliver them according to your will and grant them the comfort of your word in all their troubles, that they may depend upon your mercy in every circumstance. Hear us, O Lord, through Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever, and who taught us to pray, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen.